welcome everybody to the Behavioral Insights Week. Uh, uh, my name is Martin Velis from the Department of Political and Peace Building Affairs, and I'm part of the Innovation Cell and the Policy Mediation Division. Uh, we are very glad to, to organize uh, this session on behavioral science, diplomacy, and, and peace building. We're doing this together with our colleagues from the Office uh, of Counterterrorism. And um, let me just say a few words about the Innovation Cell and DPPA. We are a brand new entity that looks at cross-cutting approaches to prevention, mediation, and peace building, including behavioral science and, and many tech-related issues as well. And the purpose really of this panel is to explore the application of behavioral science to peace, including issues related to intergroup relations and conflict, prejudice and conflict resolution, empathy, public preferences, irrational politics, and so forth. And when it comes to uh, UN peacemaking, often uh, many of our peacemakers and mediators are intuitively applying techniques from psychology and, and behavioral economics and the mediation and preventive efforts. But we are just at the beginning to really unpack this more systematically when it comes to the track one mediation processes we support in, in DPPA. And we're very delighted and happy to have Professor Mario Fitzner with us from Brandeis University and Chloe Schombroff from the Behavioral Insights team in London to present their research. And before I introduce them in greater detail, I would uh, turn to our colleague uh, from the uh, Office of Counterterrorism, uh, Anabat, to say a few more words from there. Over to you. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, my name is Aina Bata Taeva. I'm a chief of International Hub on Behavioral Insights to Counterterrorism. It's a new uh, office that was established in Doha, Qatar in January. And uh, we have quite a wide portfolio, global coverage, and uh, three main roles to advance the research on how to apply behavioral insights in, um, in policies and programs that uh, focus on prevention of radicalization and counterterrorism, capacity building for to member states, and also you know, support establishment of professional networks, including the networks in Qatar, which has a huge educational platform to offer. We have only one hour. I don't want to take much of a time, and I will hand directly back to Martin. Uh, and I'm looking forward to this uh, very exciting conversation. Thank you so much. Well, we're very happy to have uh, Professor Barry Fitzer with us, who is the founding director of the International Master's Corps of Conflict and Court System at the Hello School and Brandeis University. And her latest book, published at Oxford University Press in May 2021 this year, is called Our Brains at War, the Neuroscience of Conflict and Peace Building. And she suggests in their book that we need to radically change how we think about war and leadership and politics. And then after her presentation, we turn to uh, Chloe Chambonf, uh, who is a senior advisor of the Behavioral Insights team, BI team, and her work has focused on the application of behavioral insights to public policy and international development programs around the world. And she has been working in Myanmar, Nigeria, and many other places where she has uh, tried to use behavioral science to promote social cohesion and peace building. Uh, we are recording that session, so if you're missing out on parts of the presentation, uh, don't worry. We're going to make that recording available on the website of the United Nations Innovation Network. And uh, following the presentations, we will have a Q&A session. Uh, feel free to use the chat anytime to raise any questions you might have. And then later on in the Q&A session, uh, we also you know, make it possible for you to, to unmute yourself and, and, and you're free to ask any questions you might have. So with that being said, indeed, we only have around uh, 55 minutes left uh, before the, the launch of the Secretary General's guidance, which happens at 11 a.m. New York time. I turn to uh, Professor Ari Fitzdorf. Uh, the floor is all yours. And I'm going to make you presenter now so you can share your slides. Thank you. Which should be possible now. Over to you. Just hold on one moment. Okay. Oh, sorry about this. My slide, slides are not coming up. Okay, I'll just start from this. Here we are. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be with you today. I just want to say it is so exciting to see um, that we're now looking at how people actually behave as opposed to the theories we have about peace and conflict. That's a very dear topic to, to my heart, as you'll see. Okay. For some reason, it is not going on. Wait till I just hold on just one second, folks. I see if I can. Sorry, folks, it doesn't seem to be. 
I seem to be asking to admit people. Okay, well, that, anyway, as Martin mentioned, that was my book. Let's hope that this works. What I'm suggesting is that we need a complementary approach to the behavioral sciences, which are about actual human behavior. And as I said, it's a relief to find us concentrating on that. The work that I'm doing is basically looking at the work of neuroscience and the biosciences, studying how the biology of how the brain and body feels affects how we feel and behave. So it's directly related to behavior. Sorry, folks, but this is not, I'm not quite sure why, why the need for, uh, okay. Um, the reason I'm doing this is that um, if you noticed in both the Brexit and the Trump campaign, uh, leaders were using ret rhetoric, as it were, to follow their uh, interests and their instincts and to appeal emotionally to people. And similar thing happened in terms of the Trump campaign. So uh, are you seeing what I'm seeing or can I just go back and see if we can do this slightly better? Okay. Sorry, otherwise, otherwise, if you like, I can show the slides from my end. The, the problem is with the hosting function here. Uh, if, if you're okay with that. Yes, okay. Um, I'll just try it once more, shall I? Or do you sure, think that... yeah, if, you, if you like, yeah. You will hear the sound, which is just people joining the, the waiting room. Okay. Okay, I have just rejoined. Okay, we just give it a second. Let me admit more colleagues. You know, 15 months after COVID and we are still not fully up to speed with Zoom. I'm not gonna apologize, just gonna acknowledge it. You know, there's no, no shame in that. Um, let me see where Maria is because there she is. I'm gonna admit her. Just gives it a little bit of a cliffhanger for all of you to stay excited. Maria muted, you unmute yourself and can I just try it? Will you make me host again and I'll try it again? Absolutely. No problem at all. Give me one second. Um, let me find you on the list. There you are. Make you host. You should be host right now. Okay. Martin, can you hear me? I can hear loud and clear, yes. Can you get Chloe to go first? Because my uh, PowerPoint seems yeah. to be on the screen. So we get Chloe to go first and then I'll be ready, okay? Sounds, sounds great. Okay. So Should I put my screen, Martin? Yeah, absolutely. Let me, uh, let me, uh, oh, you want me to go through your slides? Maybe it might be yeah, let's easier. Do that. It sounds yeah. like it's easier. That might be easier. <laughs> I know we, 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 dis we disabled some functions, so that, that has been the challenge here, but that's, that's okay. Let me just admit some more people and then find the PowerPoint. Hi everyone, I might, I might actually start whilst you're getting everything set up. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. Um, so I work for the Behavioral Insights Team, which is uh, an organization that was born inside the UK government in 2010 and which has applied behavioral insights to public policy for now a decade. Uh, we have worked in many different areas, uh, including with colleagues of yours uh, in UNDP, UNFPA, um, and also I think WHO. So we've done quite a lot of work spanning different, um, different areas. Uh, and if you can move to the next slide for me, please. Um, and what we do is um, we look at uh, behavioral insights as being uh, coming from different disciplines. So obviously there is neuroscience and Mari will talk more about this, but also psychology, behavioral economics, uh, anthropology. And what we do is we try, and we try and draw from those disciplines to understand how people actually behave in practice and how we can change their behavior. Um, and the, I guess our specificity is that we do a lot of uh, real field experiments working with governments uh, to try and see if we can really make a difference and better understand what works and what doesn't work. And I think this is really important when we're talking about peace building and social cohesion to also understand what doesn't work. And we might talk about it a bit later, but there might be instances where something that was well-intentioned has a backfire effect. And we are 
often only able to know that when we can you know assess the causal impact um, of, of that intervention. So that's something we care a lot about. We have done uh, quite a lot of randomized control trials over the year, uh, over 400 from what I can remember. Um, we work um, across the world. Um, we uh, spun out of the UK government in 2014. Uh, Martin, if you go to the next slide, you'll see the, the map. Um, and we worked in over 75 countries um, across the world. So we do two main things. One is behavioral insight. So understanding why people make certain choices and decisions. Um, and next slide, Martin, please. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, also using rigorous evaluation, in some cases, randomized control trials, but we also use other methods when uh, randomized control trials are not adapted or appropriate to the context uh, and, and the intervention we're looking to evaluate. And today, uh, if you go to the next slide, please, Martin, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about our work uh, as part of SmartPeace, which is a consortium which is funded by the um, FCDO uh, in the UK, and which is a global initiative combining the expertise of different members. So we work with local experts um, who are on the ground and do co you know, community building and capacity building um, and rehabilitation programs, etc. And we try and use behavioral insights to improve their work. We were working in Myanmar. Uh, unfortunately, you would all know because of the coup, we had to stop our efforts there. Uh, we were working on the design of a TV show to reduce um, discrimination uh, towards um, Muslim, Muslim groups um, and also to reinforce social cohesion because there are a lot of tension between ethnic groups. And in Nigeria, we've been working to improve community reintegration. Uh, and we are looking to see how we may uh, also work to. Um, increase uh, the number of people defecting uh, from Boko Haram groups, for instance. Um, so just to give you a very quick overview of the work in case you want to ask questions later on, uh, if you go to the next slide, Martin, we, these are the types of work that we do. So uh, we conducted an evidence review on behavioral insights, mass media and peace building, because we found that mass media is actually a field where there is quite a lot of evidence that short, even short content can work and change attitudes and hope behaviors. Um, we've also worked with our partners as, as part of SmartPeace to use behavioral insights to improve dialogue uh, facilitation. So uh, working with community members in Northeast Nigeria, we try to find out more about the challenges that they encounter when they are um, facilitating dialogues on the ground. For instance, people um, get really aggressive or uh, don't want to speak anymore um, or refuse to consider another person's point of view. And we looked at some techniques we could um, put in place to uh, try and change uh, the atmosphere, change the dynamic, and make the dialogue more successful. Uh, and those are evidence based. Uh, we also uh, have been working with local um, organizations to better evaluate the impact of uh, mass media interventions. So, for instance, in Nigeria, we unfortunately in that case we weren't involved in the design of the scripts but we evaluated um, a radio program um, which, where we paid participants to either listen to the um, radio program, or uh, which was focused on um, improving attitudes toward children from the associated with Boko Haram. And it, we also took a control group to compare if the show was really having an impact. Um, and I can tell you a bit more about that. And that was uh, one of the first trial, field trial um, done in, in that context, in that area, um, to, to understand if it works and if it doesn't work, what doesn't work. Um, and then we also um, are at the moment creating more content. So in this case, we actually do want to design it ourselves with our partners. So we co-create uh, different, uh, we're looking to co-create different audio uh, recordings to see if that could improve uh, people's willingness to reintegrate uh, ex-combatants from Boko Haram. Um, and uh, that, that is what we are working on at the moment. So to give you a bit more of a, an idea, um, if you can go to the next slide, Martin. This is an example. And again, I want to reiterate that this work has been done in collaboration with our partners uh, from Conciliation Resources, Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, and ETH Zurich, and the facilitators on the ground who shared with us their experiences and helped us to design a guide that helped them uh, make dialogue better. Um, and they facilitate dialogue, as I said, with um, local community members. But we also think this guide could be used for 
other types of uh, peacemakers. And uh, we are planning to publish it towards uh, the end of July, beginning of August. So I'd happily share the guide with you if you are interested. Um, and another, if we go to the, another slide, this is to show you an example of when we have um, evaluated the causal impact of a radio show. Um, and we found that the radio show increased willingness to engage with children who are formerly associated with uh, armed groups. Um, and quite in interestingly enough, we looked at gender differences as well to see if there were any differences. And actually that change was mostly driven by attitudes towards girls. Um, and we also found uh, in the script when we read them that there was some kind of um, not very acceptable <laughs> Um, scripts around violence against women. It was obviously not intentional, but there was a moment where uh, a man was basically um, not really, um, well, basically there was some problem with it. So we looked at this from a, from a quantitative perspective and we found that the show can have backfire effects. And in this case, uh, the show unfortunately increased um, acceptance um, of, uh, you know, didn't change attitudes towards violence against women in the right way. Um, and that wasn't the aim of the show, but it really shows how important it is to keep very, very close to the scripts. And we shared that with uh, the partners to say to them, you have to be very, very careful. So I'm happy to share also what this means to, to do these things uh, and this evaluation uh, in, in, you know, on the ground and what we need to pay attention to when we design uh, those shows. So that's it for me. Uh, I will pass over to Mari. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Chloe. Let's make uh, Mari um, host. Mari, you're going to be host. You have to unmute yourself. I think you're muted. You should be able to share your screen now. Yes. Okay. There you go. Am I here? Okay. Let me just. Okay. Sorry about this. Okay, let me just see if it'll come up here. Okay. See your browser now? Not the slides, we see Zoom browser. Can you see can you see my um presentation there, Martin? Not, not yet. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to share the you have to share the screen with your with the um, you have to share the PowerPoint screen. You're sharing the uh, Chrome browser now screen. Okay. Click on uh, share screen again. I had okay. it. You, you can, can you see, you can't see my slides at all? Can you not? No, can only see your Chrome browser. If you click on share screen again, you can pick which window you can share. Yes, it's actually not giving me shared screen. If you, if you want, I I can show the slides from my end. If you're okay with yes. that? Yes. The only di dilemma about that is that I then can't see them. Um, ah, you can't see them. Maybe. To the following, we're going to sort that out. How do we do this? Do this. Um, right. Let me let me reclaim the host ship and make you okay, host again. Try, yeah. try again. Try again. Okay. If you click on share screen, you can pick you can pick the screen you want to share, and you have to yes. share the screen. Is it. Okay, I think I'm on it. Oh, no, yes, yeah. Now we can see your PowerPoint. Yeah. But, can I start by giving my apologies for this, folks? Um, obviously, I have been on alert to the intricacies when somebody else is being a host. OK, first of all, thank you, Chloe. Um, I really, really enjoyed your presentation, and I very much look forward to that book that you have put together. OK. It looks like my, I'm sorry, it looks like, well, let's say I'll try this one. OK. OK, folks, so this book that I wrote was basically complementary to the work that you're doing on behavioral science. As Chloe has mentioned, uh, there, we're actually concentrating now on studying actual human behavior as opposed to theoretical behavior. My task was actually looking how the biology of the brain and the body affect how we feel, feel and behave. And why did I think that was important? Because in fact, if you have noted over the last couple of years, we've had many things that brought uh, attention to us in the West, to how irrational many of our um, attitudes are towards uh, leadership and other propositions. So in this one, you can see that um, I'm particularly looking at the Brexit and the Trump campaign. And you'll see the emotions that seem to be engendered, particularly by the Brexit debate, which we were following very closely here. And I can tell you, it was very much um, a, a frightening thing to watch in terms of how people were getting involved and not rational about the decisions that they were making. 
Um, I don't know if you can see there, but there is a photograph I have of people at a Trump rally. And the big question I have there is facts or emotions. I actually wrote a book about Trump a few years ago when people were really worried about why he was getting such a positive response to his approach, which we felt we were finding it very difficult to understand. So instinctual and emotional responses. Why do we have to look at these? Why are they so important? It's important because often we're not aware of them. That's the first thing. They're often unconscious. We're not conscious that they're powering us, that they are actually driving us towards attitudes, driving us towards behavior. Some of them are genetic, and I talk quite a bit about that in the book, and some of them are hormonal, and some of them are environmental. And there's a lot of debates about that, some of which I mention. They come basically from previous experience of survival and our capacity to thrive as human beings. And in some cases, some people have mentioned them as a mismatch with today's world. And I'll talk about that in a moment. How do they affect our behavior? Much more frequently than we like to admit. And I'm quite sure even if I were to get you at this moment in time to talk about your emotions, we could see how they distract us or they drive us. It uh, derives from the newer, newer biosciences, um, neuroscience, politics, biology, genopolitics, biopsychology, political psychology, behavioral genetics. And the book is um, awash with um, a reference to, to a lot of these sciences because many of us aren't aware of the uh, major kinds of thinking that have been happening in these fields over the last few years. And I'm hoping to get you interested in following them up. They're now being used in neuromarketing. They're now being used in neuroeconomics, neuro law, and um, neurotheology, but not as yet in the peace building field. And this is where I decided a few years ago, some of you may have read my work on the introduction um, to the idea of neuroscience and uh, peace building. They've been helped by the arrival of new tools. We couldn't have done it otherwise. Now we have fMRIs. We have a lot of electrical processes. We have a lot of uh, hormonal processes all of which are able to, uh, to be tested in a subjective way. And the reason this is important is because I'm a social psychologist and therefore a lot of my work has been based on case studies, on theories, et cetera. But in fact, neuroscience we've been able to use to actually validate or unvalidate some of the theories we have about why people behave the way they do. And the great thing about um, these processes is there's no cheating on them. For instance, um, I imagine there's many people in the room who would say that they're not prejudiced but I could put you in front of an fMRI screen that would quickly disabuse you of that. In fact, you do prejudge. We all prejudge. The problem is not the prejudging because that's a necessary part of our, our lives. Uh, the question is what we do with it. And I use this in terms of as a woman, for instance, if I'm going down a dark street at night and I look over and there's a big group of men coming towards me, I'm likely to have a different emotion than if there's a group of women coming towards me. The problem then is I begin to decide that's the way I should think about all men. So that's the difficulty, but the reality is that we all prejudge. We have many emotions we're not aware of, and we really do need to pay more attention to how they actually um, change our, our behaviors. Um, examples of how this, this, these kind of insights can help our work. For instance, I was working with a group of Mindanao facilitators once, and this was a few years ago before, thankfully they got a, an agreement. And one of the things I remember saying to them is, but how are the feelings within the groups? Not between the groups, because they were obvious, but how are the feelings within the groups? And it was as if a light had lit up because they understood that the tensions within the groups and um, who were fighting for their freedom or whatever were the problem, much more than the uh, tensions between groups. And this is something we often don't pay enough attention to. Uh, in this case, we often recommend that people do what we call single identity work. So they actually work together on their feelings and what they think about propositions and, and ideas for, for peace agreements. And that it brings to uh, any group meetings a much more settled group. And the second one then is from my own experience, fairly significant of mediation. And the example I use here is, I remember arriving in Istanbul when we were doing a fairly senior politician um, mediation. And I looked down through the uh, program and to my horror, I discovered there was absolutely no time allowed for shopping, going to the Himam, sitting and having coffee, um, because the UN funders had decided that they, it was so expensive to do these uh, mediations, and it is, that they had to fill up every moment of the time. 
But the reality is it's often in the out times, in the corridors, in the socialization that actually agreements begin to happen because that's where the empathy, the feelings begin to emerge. Many of you probably know the story of Rolf Meyer and Cyril Ramaphosa in South Africa, where Rolf got a fishing hook caught into his, in his hand. And it was only Cyril who was able to take it out of his hand. And they talk about that about the beginning of the relationship. Another one we had here was in Northern Ireland where things were very tough before the, the Belfast agreement. Uh, relationships were terrible. We only had a few days to fi finish the agreement. And unfortunately, one of the most important people, the prime minister of the Republic, his mother died. And he had to go down to Dublin for the funeral. But what he did was he kept coming back every time he could. He kept coming back to the meetings. Now, death is, very, um, it, is a very sensitive issue in Northern Ireland. We pay a lot of attention to death. And the very fact that the unionist politicians saw how um, committed he was to this mediation meant once again that it op opened up possibilities for um, feelings that he had not that ha had not been available before. Uh, and indeed, I think putting a lot of time into trying to create soft situations where empathy can develop needs a lot more attention as mediators. I can remember one a Secretary of State for Northern Ireland who's basically the British envoy in, in, in Northern Ireland saying to me, Mary, if only we could have got the DUP, that's a very hardline unionist group, to have a drink, we would have had an agreement a long time ago. And what he really was saying is if we can get people to relax together, it actually helps process the peacemaking and it happens much, much faster. And I think whatever way it happens, obviously drink is not appropriate in some cases, but whether it's singing, sightseeing, coffeeing, hammamming, whatever, all of this needs to be given a lot of attention when you're doing a mediation. The other thing that um, the, the biosciences have, have, it was a struggle for me because every time when I began this work in Northern Ireland, we had a conflict between um, the Unionist Protestants and the Catholic Nationalists. And in the middle of the night, the Protestants would go on about how they wanted a relationship with the Catholics and the Catholics would say, we're not interested in a relationship. We actually want justice for us because they were the group that had less power in Northern Ireland. Well, it turns out that the biosciences have done actually some um, uh, used fMRI and dialogue work between, for instance, Israelis and Palestinians and Mexicans and people from the United States. And what they discovered was very interesting. They discovered that, for instance, when liberal Jews felt really good when they were listening to the Palestinians talk about how hard life was in terms of education, in terms of poverty, et cetera, et cetera. But the uh, Palestinians could not feel empathy for the Israelis when they were talking about bus bombs or the way their, their society was being impacted by the violence of Hamas and other Palestinians. What did happen was that when the Palestinians felt that the Israelis were listening to them, that was when they felt empathy for the Israelis. And this explained a lot of things. And above all, it tells, tells us that we can't just do empathy dialogue work without looking also at structures, because people will not take it seriously if we don't also look at the issues of injustice. The other one I wanted to talk about was the diaspora work. Some of you may have noticed that, in fact, diasporas can often be helpful, but can often be a problem. And what you find in diaspora work is because their desire to belong often makes them become even more radical um, than people who are fighting for particular causes. And because of this, it often can be even harder for them to compromise in the end. So in fact, the kind of work that you need to do with diasporas is often very critical so that they can be accepting of the kind of compromises that are going to be made. I remember one Israeli saying to me, jokingly, I hope, he said, Mary, even if we did get an agreement, I'm not so sure that the diaspora in the United States would accept it. But that is often the feeling that you get that. And that's because of the feelings among the diaspora about the way they see um, the work that, that is heading towards compromise. The other thing is, oh, and I wanted to say, by the way, I was uh, very interested in Annabat and your work. I have got a whole chapter on radicalization. And I think once you understand the emotions that go into radicalization, it actually changed your whole approach to security work. And I think that that you would, as you probably know already, that that's very important. So two final things on this, um, don't, bother, don't bother worrying about facts. We spend a lot of our time trying to persuade people that they're wrong on certain issues um, or trying to persuade them that their memories, the, the memories they have are not the right memories. The fact is that both facts and memories are actually second to feelings, particularly feelings of belonging. So what you have to ask yourself is not why won't they agree with each other or why won't they agree with me? You have to ask, 
why is it difficult for them to agree? What will it cost them if, them to, if they agree? And one of the realities is that often costing uh, takes away a whole structure of belonging that is extremely important to them. And unless you have other ways for them to get groups that actually support them, then in fact, it's very difficult for them to make that change. Unconsciously, they will keep denying the facts. Unconsciously, they're terrified that if they accept these facts, they may have to change what they're going to do in the future. And of course, remember that fewer people uh, many fewer than we know are changed by logic. I actually did my own PhD on people who had changed, people who had been using violence and who now were no longer using it. And one of the things I found was that perhaps maybe 10, 15% of them had changed through logic, through thinking through what was possible. The rest had all changed through experiences that actually brought forth certain kinds of feelings in them, which actually made it much easier for them to think about the other community as part of their community as well. Now, I saw Martin this morning was asking us to think of impact. And in fact, impact for most of us is a problem. But however, um, yeah, oh, oh yeah, just before I finish, um, the price of not understanding feelings can actually be quite high and it can even cost you an election. And those of you who weren't paying attention to the election of Donald Trump, what you may not realize was that it was, I believe, and many others have written about this as well, it was a particular sentence by Hillary Clinton that actually lost, lost her a lot of her supporters um, and uh, made sure that Trump supporters were absolutely, um, uh, absolutely clear that they were going to vote for Trump. And that was a term deplorables. Just imagine if somebody were to come up here, the Secretary General were to come up here and say, I deplore the lot of you. I deplore all of you, you're not working hard enough. Just imagine how that would make you feel. And it just as an example of how negative um, feelings can actually uh, make it much more difficult to get an agreement. In terms of impact, uh, believe it or not, it's actually quite easy in terms of neurosciences. You just bring in the usual neuroscience tools. You can measure dopamine, serotonin, all of these hormones that are actually part and parcel of um, making an agreement, part and parcel of what's happening in conflicts. Um, you also can very easily uh, mention mirror neurons, et cetera, et cetera. It's much easier uh, to actually use the neuroscience tools than it is in terms of a lot of other situations. However, I suspect that you can actually test people's emotions changing right through, for instance, the case of the, over a weekend or over weeks or over years. But the fact is, of course, I can't imagine that the United Nations is going to present all of you with fMRI tools or measurement of hormonal tools or whatever. But there are a lot of other things that you can do informally. For instance, I would always look for body language and people no longer actually looking at people looking in people's eyes where they haven't before moving towards them actually spontaneously talking to them sitting beside them at the meals in terms of when they go home actually sharing plane seats or train seats or whatever there's all sorts of ways in which you can actually judge that your work is being successful in that important work of actually opening up people to each other so that they can make peace agreements together now i want to finish by saying this is only one tool um, you and I and all of us know that, in fact, it's contexts that, by and large, um, are, unfa are unfavorable to situations of conflict, conflicts that are unjust, where exclusion happens on a widespread term in terms of groups, etc. So it's only one tool. But I think in behavior, in terms of understanding why behavior happens, um, it's actually useful because very often you can start your notes and have a little side um, a session in which you can say to yourself, what are the emotions that are in the room? What is happening? How are these groups feeling? And actually by doing that, you can often swing a conversation, you can change a community, you can change a society. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, both of you, for, for, the, uh, for the presentation. This is really to kickstart a conversation. And I see some questions are coming in already in the chat. Uh, there was a question with regard to the dialogue handbook from Anna, and I, I understand from Chloe that the handbook uh, she was referring to will be launched soon and made public soon so uh, uh, stay stay tuned so to say um, a few things uh, that came up and I think that's important when we think about the upcoming guidance of the Secretary General on Behavioral Science is this crossover of different disciplines and I was wondering whether both of you can actually elaborate about you know a bit more about how will behavioral science make a difference we have seen that there's a crossover of different disciplines that many of us in this field bring to the table like social psychology or conflict resolution if I wanted to call this a science for itself or, or peace mediation, right? So there's the question in the room from colleagues here whether or not this is just old wine in new bottles, 
Is that just old buying and new bottles? Are we just talking about the same things we have been talking about you know, for, for decades? That's question number one to the panelists. I'm just waiting for more questions from the audience. And the second one is really about a concrete example you have seen where behavioral science has made a difference in delivering on PC security, a very concrete example. And the examples that are floating around when it comes to nudges are, you know, make the plate smaller so people eat less food, they can ask for second service, right? Or compare your electricity bill with your neighbor. So there's competition fights, right? So those are the, the insights, the nudges that are introduced in the non-peace world. And I wondered whether you can give us an example from the peace and security world that could give us, you know, a clear idea of how behavioral science could make a difference. So those two questions, is that just old wine and new bottles and then a concrete example? And, and while while you uh, uh, prepare your answers or, or you, you give us your answers, I'm admitting a few more people to the chat and please use uh, the chat function to raise any questions you might have. So Chloe, is it okay if we start with you? Uh, yeah, um, very happy What to are start. your thoughts? Uh, I think I would frame them in three ways. Science matters, behavioral science matters and evaluation matters. So a lot of the, uh, a lot of the interventions that are designed uh, by practitioners are often not evidence-based at all regardless of which science you use to design your interventions. Um, there was a review by the Department for International Development uh, in the UK in 2016 on intervention to prevent or mitigate armed violence in developing and low, low and middle income countries, which was called developing at the time, uh, in the title. And they found that only 2% of the article were high quality studies showing what worked. So that just shows you how little evidence there is around what works to uh, reduce violence. Uh, and that's that's a real pity because uh, first of all, we need to use the evidence we have to apply it to those interventions. So we give ourselves the best chances of success. But we also then need to evaluate to make sure that our interventions are having the intended impact. Uh, and as I said, there can be backfire effects sometimes. So that's why it's so, so important to, to measure this. And I know that randomized control trials are not always a solution, but they can be, uh, they can, they, I think we can do a lot more quantitative um, you know, measurements. And to your questions about drawing from different disciplines, I mean, there is so much we can draw from uh, various disciplines, including in terms of methods. A lot of the work we do is also including you know, interviews and surveys, but also design thinking. So for instance, when we were thinking about the reintegration of um, Colombian ex fox we were looking at what does the reintegration journey look like? You know, why is it that they are not managing to reintegrate properly? Where are the pinpoints where we can really make a behavioral difference? Um, so I think it's really important to uh, draw from those disciplines, do it with uh, a, a methodology, uh, with rigor, and, and be very open and honest about the, the findings. I think what I found very hard working with uh, organization on the ground is a lot of them rely on you know, organizations such as the UN or the international um, other international development funders. And so they don't necessarily have an incentive to know what works because if we find that their uh, intervention don't work, they may not be able to get funding later on. So we have found it actually quite difficult to try and convince a uh, local organization that they need to look at uh, what works and, and, and try and improve it if it doesn't work. Um, in terms of an example that I can think of, um, there is some work uh, conducted by uh, Blattman in, in Liberia, where they looked at, uh, they, they basically recruited uh, about 1,000 very high, high risk young men in, in Liberia's capital. These men were involved in you know, drug dealing and theft and had a lot of violent confrontation with um, you know, community members, the police, etc. And they assigned them to uh, different uh, interventions. One was that they received uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, for eight weeks. The other one was that they would receive cognitive behavioral therapy and then a few months later would receive cash. They would receive cash only or neither uh, cash nor behavioral um, cognitive behavioral therapy. And what was fascinating was that uh, the CBT did actually uh, work and reduce uh, criminal behavior within two to five weeks. Uh, but actually over time that effect sort of dis dissipated. And the uh, real sort of effect was when you um, combine co cognitive behavioral therapy with cash, and then you saw that the antisocial behavior, the, the decrease in antisocial behavior, which was much longer lasting. And I think that brings me to a point which is, it's really important to measure behaviors, real behaviors. And I think uh, Mari, you pointed at that, 
not just stated intention of what people say they think or say they do, but what they actually do. Um, and uh, it's also really important to try and measure change over time, because even if your intervention shows a change, it might just be for a few weeks and then over time it, it dissipates. So if we can allow ourselves to do this, I think we can really make a bigger difference and really enrich uh, the uh, evidence that exists out there and share it amongst ourselves so we are better practitioners with better tools. Okay, shall I follow? Please, please Maria, come in on that. <clears throat> okay, so thank you, Chloe. Um, I was just interested, first of all, in the question about disciplines. Uh, in our program in Brandeis, we invite every discipline. So sometimes we have lawyers, we have uh, international politics, we have people from English literature, we have, because deliberately, because there is, I think it is a problem. One of the problems in our field is that international politics has in a way taken over the field. The problem about international politics is it cannot deal with the new wars. And I have met many a despairing dean of international politics who says they don't have the vocabulary, they don't have the understanding. What is happening? Because the old power uh, plays do not actually, I mean, how do you argue with a suicide bomber if you're an international political scientist? That's, and that is a real problem. Obviously, there is some uh, international um, work going on uh, needed at the moment. Fascinating to see um, Biden and Putin and the way Biden brought emotions into that uh, meeting. He was only, uh, he was waiting as it were, he wasn't interested in settling anything, but he was just, he was re resettling the relationship, which I thought was important. That's the first thing. So I think we need to have a much more interdisciplinary approach. And I think all of our courses, one of the things that worries me is that particularly the PhD courses are all located within particular disciplines rather than actually being multidisciplinary because people are afraid to let go of their discipline. Second thing is, in terms of nudges, and I mentioned a few when I was talking about, you know, Mindanao and South Africa, et cetera, but one from home. So we really wanted people to feel positive about uh, the capacity, our capacity to get an agreement. And we had invited Bono to sing in Belfast. And we had invited the head of the Unionists, um, David Trimble, and the head of the Nationalists, um, John Hume, to actually come together on the stage with him at the end. And they said they would go on the stage, but they refused to shake hands. They would not shake hands. So here we were, we had a wonderful concert with Bono. Everybody was feeling great, but these two guys would not even shake hands. So a quiet word in the ear of Bono and bless him, he is amazing. So when they came out on the stage, he took the hand of one, the hand of the other, and he raised it in the air. So every paper the next day had a positive sign of the possibility of people actually coming to an agreement. However, we also were aware that the politicians were very afraid of actually compromising. What do you do about politicians who are really fearful because they will lose? Don't forget, you know, this thing about the people want peace and the politicians don't, that's not true. Politicians are very sensitive to, to their constituencies and they were very sensitive that they would lose people if they actually went for a compromise. So what we did was one of our colleagues actually did a survey in one of, one of the major newspapers, which actually turned out luckily to show that the people were more, much more willing to compromise than the politicians had thought. And on the basis of that, we were able to change the feelings about what was possible for the politician. And in fact, it really helped in terms of moving people towards an agreement. So those were the different kind of nudges. And one of the things that worries me is we don't take these things seriously. But when you've been, as many of you have been in a conflict, you know what turns things around. And it often is a happen chance thing, but it is very often an emotional thing as well. Well, thank you so much. And it reminds me of, you know, research we've seen in the Innovation Cell on humor and international relations and how much cracking a joke can actually spark a conversation. And we saw that two years ago, pre-COVID, when, um, you know, uh, the Iranian president met uh, with uh, the UK prime minister and, and the French uh, uh, prime minister at the time and what kind of dynamics that created as well. And that was as we, as we saw in the news later on, quite deliberate actually by those diplomats. So it was not just a coincidence, it was actually quite deliberate uh, to literally uh, break the ice, so to speak. Um, I'm, I'm just picking up on a few questions that are in the chat and one is with regard to risk. And when we think about you know, uh, high level diplomacy, we, we are very conscious that this is a, usually a very conservative field. And uh, the question is in the room whether you know, we're actually looking at manipulative approaches here to human behavior. And what are your concerns or thoughts in that regard? Do we need a UN ethics board, an oversight board, for instance, for any kind of neuroscience and behavioral science related activities of the United Nations in that field? 
what's your thinking? I think we need to address that elephant in the room as well. And then a second question is with regard to the lack of evidence. Why do you think we are lacking evidence in that field of peacemaking, prevention, and peace building? Why is that that when it comes to peace building activities or development issues at large, we have seen really a, a mushrooming of behavioral science approaches, but when it comes to this very delicate political field, why have we seen like a lack of evidence? So those two questions, and we have a few more minutes for more questions to raise in, in the chat, but maybe back to, to you, Mari, to, to answer first, and then to Chloe. Okay, I, one of the most difficult sessions that we tend to have with our students who come from about 70 different countries, and they don't come to us until they're in their 30s, they have to have five or six years experience in conflict issues in the field. And one of the things you find um, is that we have to have a session on ethics. Have we, um, is it permitted for us to try and change people's attitudes? Is it permitted for us to put them in situations which won't be explained beforehand, but in which we are trying to change the way in which they look at each other, et cetera? And um, the, the answer tends to be, if we are not doing it, somebody else is. I mean, the reality is every newspaper is doing it. The reality is every uh, senior politician is doing it. Uh, the uh, prime minister is doing it. Everybody is trying to. Uh, and by the way, one of the things I did not mention, uh, but is really frightening for us, is I have a whole chapter on social media and how that actually can affect people, it can tighten their attitudes, it can make them feel held hateful, et cetera. So, you know, to say we can't try and change people in the face of particularly social media, but all of the other aspects of people pressuring people to come to the agreement that they want, as opposed to an agreement that will serve um, all of the community as well. On the second issue of um, why we haven't don't I mean, we, we must remember our field is still a new field. We're still not even agreed on the name. I'm calling it peace building. You're calling it something else. So I think that um, we have to allow for the fact that we are a new field. And for instance, the work that Chloe's doing, the work that the UN is doing, that I'm doing, we are actually beginning to aggregate, I do think, a body of work particularly in terms of, Martin, you yourself have written a, a book on mediation. You know, we're beginning to be able to look at things and maybe refine the tools that we have and the processes that we have. I think the thing that makes it very difficult is one of the things um, that you never do, as you would know when you intervene in a context, is you say, well, they had something the same in Myanmar. There's something the same in, in um, South Africa. People always say their own conflict is different. And it is. Therefore, you never offer, uh, you never suggest anything. You sometimes say, well, they tried this, they tried that, et cetera. Every con uh, a conflict really is, has got its own sort of nuances and sensitivities. And I think the fact is that we're still trying to um, pull out of that generic factors that actually are important. But I do think that um, uh, if you look at the way the literature is developing, if you look at the work that the field is doing, I do think that we're on um, a, perhaps on an edge of the field being taken seriously. Let me remind every one of you that it's not too many years since, for instance, the um, army thought that we were all tree huggers. Remember, they thought anybody who looked at peace with now, in fact, many of our field, many of our people are actually working with the army, teaching in the schools, teaching in the military schools, because they are realizing they need a lot of what we have in terms of mediation, peace processes, what you do after a peace agreement has been made, post-conflict work, etc. So I think we should give ourselves credit for where we've got to and actually realize that, you know, it is an exciting field to be in. Uh, the, uh, the answers are beginning to emerge. And I think those of us who are involved in now will feel that, it, you know, it's, it's been worth the effort and the time we put into it. I think on the question of uh, the lack of evidence, I think sometimes the truth can be threatening, right? Especially if you get your funding from, from organizations. So I think you in the UN have enormous power to try and encourage, you know, finding the truth and finding what works and also acknowledging that if something doesn't work, then maybe you don't stop the funding, but you just maybe try and understand how the intervention can be changed. So I think funders have a huge role to play in this and in encouraging evidence-based approaches. Um, I also think that it's true in some spheres of, you know, negotiation at the highest level. Of course, the randomized control trial is not going to be desirable, could deflect the whole process. So we have to be very mindful when we want to introduce those approaches. Um, and I also think that it might be better when we are looking at mass media, for instance, or changing the behaviors of many, many people. There is a real question around ethics. And for instance, at the Behavioral Insights team, we have an ethical process every time we do, we do a study that has some kind of um, issue. So that was the case in Nigeria. We had to think about the questions we ask around uh, Boko Haram and other groups that are very, very sensitive in the community. 
But my question is also, is it ethical to rule out and, and scale up an intervention when we don't even know if it works? And there have been evidence of backfire effects, for instance, when you um, have a very well intentioned show, uh, you, you hope to change behavior, but actually maybe the way that you do the show, so for instance, doing a, a talk show, so when you talk about the show afterwards, makes people realize that maybe you want to change their behavior and they don't like that and it has a backfire effect. So I think we, we owe to ourselves to also make sure we are evaluating in the best possible way with, with the you know, means available. But um, I think a common, a common uh, belief is that uh, randomized control trials are very expensive, but actually they're not, they, they don't necessarily need to be. There is a lot we can do. For instance, we are looking at how we can use our online randomized control trial to try and see uh, on Facebook, for instance, in, in Myanmar, a lot of people have access to Facebook and there are very few research agencies who have a representative panel. So we have had to be creative, you know, trying to use Facebook to try content even before it is broadcast. And by the time your content is broadcast, you have a better chance of, you know, increasing social cohesion when you know it's working. Thanks so much. This, this, is, this is fascinating. As we said from the beginning, and Mari elaborated on this with regard to research findings, you know, um, we are just in an early stage of, of discovering the field and then, you know, it has to be applied and, and, and seen to what extent actually it, uh, we can benefit from it for, for interventions that are happening, you know, in a, in a higher altitude, so to speak. There's a question in the room uh, about power. And, and we hear this, we heard this many times, you know, when we tried to, to explore over the last six months, the field of behavior science in the context of prevention, mediation, and peace building. And, and things we heard was, number one, these are not behavioral barriers we're trying to tackle. These are kind of uh, society norms that we can never break through, right? The, their behavioral science will be powerless in addressing that. And the second one, and that comes from Tanisha here in the chat, is about power. Are we actually talking when it comes to you know, high-level diplomacy efforts about power choices and, and rational choice models where behavioral science cannot really be helpful? So what, what's, your, what's your thought on that? related to power irrationality and how uh, behavioral science can help us to tackle uh, vulnerabilities and emotional manipulations. Mari, you want to take that one? Okay, I just first of all want to mention that um, evaluation has been taken very seriously by the Alliance for Peace Building, and they actually have a lot of, uh, they have a very good committee working on it. So if people look around, they'll see it has been taken very, very seriously. So I want to, I mentioned that there was a while ago when the um, army thought of us as, um, who, who are often one of the most powerful people in the room in terms of sorting out these, these conflicts. They thought of our field as tree huggers and that now that actually has changed. So an example, a few years ago, um, it was thought that the State Department would change the budget uh, and uh, it, it was trying to take away the budget from uh, peace building and from development. And there was a group in the Alliance for Peace Building that got together and they said, well, OK, who can change this? They got 140 generals, ex-generals mostly, to actually sign a letter to the State Department saying that they should not let go of the money for soft power. That soft power today was even more important than getting more munitions, getting more planes, getting more whatever. We must remember that it was 12 box cutters that cut down 9-11, and it was a few drones that took down Saudi Arabia just a while ago. So the fact is that we actually did, a, a, at that stage, you got people who seemingly had the power, they had the military power, and they did change their mind because they saw it was not working. I was just talking to uh, Sir General Rupert Smith, who's just brought out another a second edition of his Utility of Force. Uh, there's about three books. I have one here, one by Akin saying, you know, it just isn't working. Force is not working in today's world. So when we talk about things changing, that is an amazing shift. And that actually is just a testimony to what can be done by people having discussions about are we getting where we want to and trying to see if we can do it better. Chloe, what are your thoughts on, on power, irrationality and, and added value of behavioral science? Yeah, I think uh, a, key, a key thing you need to consider when delivering interventions such as the one we are trying to look at, for instance, to be broadcast on North East Nigeria radio, is who is in the room helping you to shift those messages. And it can't be a, a group of you know, white, uh, young, uh, psychology educated scientists in London. And that's why we put a lot of uh, importance on getting a diverse team, but also working very closely with experts on the ground. And I think that's why you know, when we design an intervention, we, we do it very closely with our partners uh, because they know the context better. 
we know what works and we try and combine this together and create the best possible intervention. But it's unthinkable to try and think and do it on your own. It would be probably not very impactful and it defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do. But it's a very good question to, to be asking ourselves constantly. Please, Mario, come in. I just want very quickly to say, one of the things that saddens me is going around the world, seeing so many people doing such fantastic work, but not ensuring that it hits those people who are in power. You know, people to people groups, you have thousands of them in some situations. What they don't do is they don't involve the people who are eventually going to be making the decisions like the politicians. And I think that actually we should up our game because there is certainly, um, we know in some situations where this has been attempted, it has actually worked. There are many ways of engaging with power. And I do believe that every intervention should start at the beginning in terms of how do we eventually engage with those who really are going to be able to change the situation. So I just think we, we should take power more seriously and realize our own power in terms of actually engaging with it in conflict situations. That's a, that's a beautiful closing remark. We have a, a two more minutes left, but uh, I wanted to conclude the, the, the panel now. I'm going to post also the, uh, the link to the next event here in the chat, which will be on the launch of the Secretary General's guidance on behavioral science. And um, yeah, let me just uh, say thank you so much to, to, uh, uh, to Mari and Chloe for this excellent presentation. Uh, as mentioned to all of you, we are just at the beginning, so Stay in touch with us on the additional events. Uh, we will also make the recording available. If you have missed out uh, on the beginning of the presentations, um, you can revisit the, the recordings later on. Uh, and um, let me also thank again our colleagues at uh, the Counterterrorism Office, particularly Ken, to, uh, you know, for setting up this meeting uh, together with us. And, and uh, please check out the program of the Behavioral Science Week. Uh, there are many other events happening this week. I posted the link in the chat earlier. So once again, thanks so much to, uh, to Mari and Chloe for, for, for joining us today. I'm gonna give you a virtual applause here with, with, uh, in, in Zoom, so to say. Yeah. Uh, I can't wait for, for the pandemic to be really over to see you both in New York. Uh, colleague, thanks so much for joining. Thanks so much for, for the great questions. Have a wonderful day. Uh, check out additional events of the BSI week and see you all soon.